Good day. Welcome to episode 16 of the Aaron Wayne podcast. Do you got an hour in you? Because this one is about an hour. Talk about everything here, man. Talk about how spiritual practice can help. My phone's ringing. It was my grandma. Yeah, big podcast today. Talk about spiritual practice and how we can shed our ideas of what society wants us to be. I also talk about my friend uh, running 100 miles. I talk about an accident that I got in in my van, which is pretty crazy. I talk about teaching yoga and feeling dull while doing it and how I feel great when I teach yoga. So this, and also talk about people on Instagram who are trying to steal your money by giving you inspiration. So if you're ready, let's do it. What's up, y'all? I hope you guys are doing well. I'm out here kicking it. It is Monday for me. Yesterday was Valentine's Day. I was teaching a yoga teacher training all day for about 10 or so hours. So the day before that, we had our Valentine's Day, the day of love. This will probably get posted like two weeks after Valentine's Day, but that's what I was up to on Saturday. Had a little beer with my lady. We did a spa night. I put on a face mask, did the whole thing. And while we were at the brewery, I found out that my wife doesn't subscribe to my podcast. Isn't that strange? I thought it was strange, at least. I had this idea. I was listening to uh, something. I don't know. Dude, speaking of which, I just found this app. I saw it on Gary V. Hold on. Let me pull this up. It's called Clubhouse. It is chaos in Clubhouse. I don't know if I'm following the wrong people. If you know anything about Clubhouse, um, hook your boy up with some info because this Clubhouse thing is its just chaos. It's just these rooms and there's like thousands of people watching these. They aren't even watching. It's all audio, 100% audio. I hope my mic stand doesn't break. If it breaks, we're going to deal with it as it goes. But this Clubhouse app, man, it's just insane. Like, it's just random people. I saw one today that I was I was looking into and listening in on with uh, Maria Popova, who writes, oh, what is her blog? I don't know, it's a great blog, but I get the newsletter. And then James Clear, who wrote... Um, a book on habits, atomic habits, which I started and didn't finish because basically he's saying that habits are important and the way that you do them is, um, by doing them, <laughs> by like creating good habits with cues and response and stuff. It's like a lot of the same stuff, but the, they were just like running through conversation on this app. And so I get ones like that, which are really interesting. And then the first time I logged into the app, I just listened to a bunch of people like, like flirting with each other. It was like a group of like 10 people and there were like hundreds of people listening to this. And it was one girl was like, you cute. And the other guy was like, I know, you know, sometimes I, you know, my, I took time with my push. And it's just like, they're flirting with each other. I'm like, what is this? What is this app? And the title of the room, because they call them rooms is just like, um, I don't even know what it was, but it was like definitely a lot of capital letters and a lot of emojis. And I'm thinking, oh, this is, this is a medium for people um, that don't want to write, <laughs> that don't actually want to make something, which is fine. That's not a judgment um, because making this podcast is extraordinarily easy. It was really hard to figure out how to post it. And when I say really hard, I mean like I figured it out. So it can't be that hard. But um, so the, I do the podcast because it's way easier than doing anything else than, that I want to create. But this clubhouse thing is even easier. You just turn, like, you just open up the app. I'm not going to do it. I was going to open up the app. I'm not going to do that. It's crazy. It's just crazy what people are into and what they do with apps. Like, I was also thinking about this. I have, uh, um, well, I don't want to call that person out. Um, so, like, people, I, I've noticed, and I do this. So, like, I have uh, my Google Calendar, which, like, runs my life effectively, and I was thinking about how much we give to technology and not only are we giving it our phone numbers, I remember a couple of phone numbers. I remember my mom's cell phone number. It is five. No, I'm not going to give you my, uh, I know my wife's cell phone number. And then I know, um, two of my really good friends that I grew up with their phone numbers from middle school, which haven't changed. Bruno and Sam, I'm talking to you. They have the same cell phone number from middle school, which is just blows my mind. I have no, I had like 15 cell phones when I, from between the ages of 12 years old 
and 32. Yeah, I'm 32. I know I look young. I know I look hip. And it's because I am. But I ha- I've had like 15 cell phone numbers. One of my cell phone numbers was 514-0000. Give those people a call. I don't know who they are. Is this doxing somebody? Am I doxing somebody? I have no idea who it is, so I can't be doxing somebody. But that used to be my cell phone number, and I would put that on like my, like, I'd, you know, you go to the doctor for a physical or whatever, and I put that on, and they're like, is that really your number? It's like, yeah, dude. I used to give... I used to give uh, my two friends that have the same middle school phone number. Um, I used to give their phone number on like surveys and stuff. You know, like what's your cell phone number? Like you go to you go to CVS or something or Walgreens, and they're like, "What's your cell phone number?" I'm like, "You don't get my cell phone number. You're gonna get Bruno's cell phone number." Um, it's just story. Once I was in middle school. And I had gotten a cell phone and this was early days. I think I was in high school, probably freshman year. Uh, This is early days, like before cell phones were like super big, like before the invention of the iPhone, which was in 2007, which is when I graduated high school. Um, So this is like 2005 or so. And I had a cell phone. It was a Nokia. Shouts out to the people who know what I'm talking about. A little walkie talkie thing. You could walkie talkie people on a cell phone. Apparently my watch does that now. I haven't figured, tried to do it, but apparently it does that. So I'm at Waffle House with a different set of friends and, um, again, best friends, like really good buddies, still friends with them to this day. And we're at Waffle House at like two in the morning because that's what you do when you're a sophomore and your parents aren't watching you. So I call the Waffle House. I don't even know how I got the number because I couldn't have Googled the number. So I even telling this story, I'm like, there's a hole somewhere and I don't know where that hole is. Maybe it was on the menu or something. And so we're at the Waffle House, we're having our, our wafflies and I call the, I like have my phone under the table and I call the, the Waffle House and it's like the phone is back where the kitchen is. You know, you can see the kitchen in Waffle House, which is sort of cool, but also sort of like, I'd rather you just make my dirty hash browns where I don't have to watch that you're not wearing gloves and you're, you know, you're sneezing and wiping your eyebrows all the time. And they, so they, they, they're cooking the food and I call and they go answer the phone. They're like, hello, Waffle House, Winchester, blah, 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 blah. Have a good day. Like whatever, whatever they're supposed to, the corporate overlords tell them to say. And they're like, hello, are you there? And then they hang up. And I do that like three more times and in like intermittent bursts throughout our meal. And then eventually the, the guy gets really ticked off and he's like, I can hear people talking. And it's like, he's hearing himself talking, like echoing back stop calling here. They get super heated and we're like giggling, like giggle fits, you know, 15 years old, just heavy giggle fits. And then I go home, whatever, whatever. And then a week later I played football at the time, not to brag, but, uh, on a Saturday morning at like eight 30 in the morning, I get a phone call and the phone call says, yeah, I'm calling about the, uh, the fridge. Um, can you deliver it to, I don't know, Front Royal or whatever, which is like 40 minutes away or whatever from Winchester. And I was like, I'm not selling a fridge. And then those calls kept happening all throughout that day. And I told my mom, I was like, mom, what is, what's happening? Cause I'm still a kid. I'm 15. I'm still a child. And she's like, all right, sounds like you did something and someone's getting you back. And so she had, I don't know if she had a Valley trader or whatever. Valley Trader is like the, it's like a, it's like Facebook marketplace, except on paper for those of you that are before Facebook time, if you're listening to this. Um, and they had put in an ad and that's how they got back at me, which is genius. I mean the cap, like, I don't know if it costs money to take an ad out in Valley Trader. I reckon it probably does. It probably costs money to do that. So not only did they take the number, they star 67 it, which isn't a thing anymore. Can you star 67 someone? They star 67 me, took the number down and then they created an ad, you know, that shows, in, that shows ingenuity, shows creativity. Um, and, and I'm proud of them and you know, I'm wishing them the best. Hopefully they either found a fulfilling career at Waffle House or they found a different one. I, ho- I hope I wish them the best. And I don't say that sarcastically because I deserved it. Let's have a sip of water. Mm, 10 minutes in. Here we go. 
I almost choked on my water. I got to slow down. But yeah, we're outsourcing our intuition to apps. That's uh, this is how I got on this rant. We rely on our cell phones to do so much. Um, like there are apps that can like tra- like I have a Whoop, not a sponsor, no big deal. I pay the subscription fee and I'm thinking about not having it. But it does this thing where it rec- uh, records your heart rate variability and then assesses how much um uh, cardiovascular strain you should have based upon what your heart rate variability is do you want to know what heart rate variability is um i don't really know um (laughs) i tell people that it's the measure between the beats of the heart but i don't really know what that means i mean i know what that sentence means but i don't really know the signifier of that so the app tells me like hey you're 74 percent recovered today so go have fun go have a blast fella And then other days, if I don't sleep well, or if I drink beer, that really affects my heart rate variability because it affects my sleep, I think. It uh, tells me that you're 20% recovered, so take it easy today. But like, it doesn't necessarily have a correlation between how I actually feel and how it tells me I'm supposed to feel. And so like, I'm outsourcing and listening to this app that actually isn't correlating with what my actual intuition about what my fitness is. And I just think it's interesting that we're allowing apps to create situations where these intuition muscles start to atrophy, right? If I'm not paying attention to how my body feels after training and I'm letting an app do it for me, then eventually that muscle will atrophy. There's a really good line from, I don't know who said it. It's one of these yogis, one of these old school yogis. And the line is, what is the line? Shouldn't even have brought it up, Aaron. What are you doing? Come on, Rico. Um, The line was something to the effect of the spiritual world, whatever that means. The spiritual world or the spiritual experience is unattainable to the average person in the West, I think, because we have let those muscles atrophy. So if I were to tie that back into like into a tighter sentence, I would say that this quote is, is to paraphrase this quote is we haven't been practicing spiritual practices. So we don't even know what that world is. And we don't know what the spiritual spirit experience is because we've allowed those muscles to atrophy through not engaging, right? Just like any muscle, right? And so as we do this more and more with apps, I think we're going to sort of lose some of our humanness, but do I need to know people's cell phone numbers? Do I need to know what 81 times 7 is? You might know it. You might have just been able to figure it out right there. I didn't do well with my times tables because I wasn't a great student. Um, So I don't need to know that. I can just use my phone for it. Yeah. I taught a... Uh, so I did YTT this weekend, which felt great. I, um, I've been teaching a lot of yoga regularly. I just started up a new Friday 6 a.m. class, which is where I like started that was like my roots of teaching yoga. I uh, came out of yoga teacher training, got all my homework done, which is like, you have to do observations and you have to do personal practice and you have to do like, there's just like yoga teacher training. Isn't just like being in a room, learning how to teach yoga. It's also like here, go do some other stuff too, so that it supplements what you're working on. And I, uh, I finished all that three week program And then I got a gig right out of it uh, from the people who trained me how to do yoga. They were like, okay, he can do it, so let's give him a job. So Friday, 6 a.m., I started, and, like, I'm not a morning person, but I quickly became, like, very dependent on caffeine. Um, And, yeah, I just crush caffeine now, as you can tell from these ramblings that I have on this podcast. But so I started that 6 a.m. class again. It feels good because it's, like, it's like the roots is what I'm alluding to, was what I'm referencing. It's like where I started. It was hot yoga at 6 a.m. And uh, like that is a breed of people that come into that room and they're ready for like loud music and quick, fast movements and like creativity. And like it's a, just a beautiful expression of what the physical yoga practice can be. But, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I taught a really crappy yoga class, man. And it like it wasn't that it was crappy for the students. Like I know like when you're in front of a room full of people, you can tell like are they 
are they listening? Are they tuned in? What are they interested in what it is that we're up to? So you can, you can, you can suss that out. You can feel it. And, uh, you know, the people were into it, but you know, I was sort of just like going through the motions and I share that because I don't think that's something that yoga teachers tend to share or people that are leading in any capacity. You know, sometimes you're in front of a room and it's just like, for so many people, just being in front of other people is so impressive to them because they don't see themselves doing it that they don't notice the subtleties of someone being like sort of not into it, right? And kind of going through the motions. And sometimes in the yoga practice that happens as a teacher, like, and any like anybody who's listening to this who um, is interested in becoming a yoga teacher or has been teaching and kind of feels this, this is why I want to share it is because it's part of the game, you know? And what that was a signifier for me is that I need to freshen things up. I need to watch some teachers that I haven't watched before, or I need to um, commit more time to my own personal practice, or I need to read some of the books, right? Like I have my bookshelf over here. I need to get back into the text. I need to get back into, you know, the breath and the meditation and stuff. And I need to get a little bit deeper in that. And I need to allow myself to be creative because when you're teaching a yoga class and you're not in a space that's like, man, I am psyched to be here. Reference to the sports junkies, DC 101, back in like 2001, siced. If you know what I'm talking about, let me know. But uh, yeah, if you're not siced to be there, then you're sort of like missing out on what being a yoga teacher is, which is like, yeah, you can teach people how to move their body and you can do it in a safe way and you can even do it in a creative way. But if you're not fully engaged with it, you're missing out on the benefits of being the teacher. The students are still getting like, a great practice they're getting breath work and meditation and movement and all the stuff like they're getting the benefits of the practice but as the teacher you're missing out on the benefits and so i think um i was listening to a, something a podcast or whatever and uh they were talking about do it was uh, this is who it was it was jesse itzler if you know who that is he's um i think he he his wife is the ceo of Spanx, which is a company that sells like like skin tight clothing, like leggings and stuff. And then he is the CEO of like Vita Coco or CO C2O coconut water, some coconut water company, Zika or something like that. But he's also this like endurance athlete and like really motivational guy and just like strange and quirky. And he has this idea about a life resume, which is really interesting. Speaking of which another tangent jumping off, let's see if I can get back to where I was. My buddy, um, just ran a hundred miler and he texted me the other day and he wants to come on the podcast. So I might actually have a podcast guest coming up, which, uh, I don't know how I feel about that because I sort of lose a little bit of control if I have a podcast guest and I'm like, as a public school teacher, I want to be, um, I don't want to be careful about what I think, but I want to be careful about how it's presented because, you know, I teach 13 year old kids. So I want to make sure that I'm a positive influence. Um, in how I represent myself in the digital space. So I'm gonna have him on and he's a good friend of mine and I love him and he actually, and I went through yoga teacher training together. So that's how he and I got to know one another and uh, he's gonna come on, he's gonna do, he's gonna talk about his 100 mile race because he and I haven't even talked about it yet. We've texted a little bit, but we haven't had a thorough conversation about it. But I was talking about yogurts being stale at times and then I was talking about Jesse Itzler. And so, oh, so this is it. Jesse Itzler says, find, he said this, and like it's one of these like cheesy Instagram, like find your passion, man, kind of things. And uh, which like some days I want to hear that and I need to be reminded of that. And then other days I'm like, man, you're just, this is all tricks. You're just playing. I know what tricks are. I know what the tricks are. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I teach for a living, both as a public school teacher and as a yoga teacher. I know how these people are using tricks in order to get attention. Um, And it feels manipulative at times. Back to my major point, which is he said, what is the thing that makes you feel most alive? And that's good advice, right? It can be, it can be weaponized and turned into something that you, you know, make a 20 page PDF to charge people $50 for to find their passion. But I think it's true. Like what are the things that make you feel most alive? And the things that make me feel most alive are when I'm teaching, when I'm in front of people, even like this, like even in this digital space in front of people 
sharing the things that I have learned. So I have been fortunate enough to, I found another quote from a friend. She said, uh, you didn't make good choices. You've had good choices, which is worth repeating. It's not that you made good. Okay. Calendar notification. It's not that you made good choices is that you, it's that you had good choices. You had a suite of choices that you could choose from that allowed you to have good choices and to make good choices. And so I'm definitely privileged in the fact that like, even though, you know, experienced poverty growing up and I experienced challenges and like all these different things, like all true, but I still had a suite of choices that I could choose from that were, I got to turn these notifications off that were able to put me in a position where I, now I'm the person who's in front of people teaching them things, whether it's students or faculty or yogis. And so I think finding the thing that makes you feel most alive is probably like, it seems like almost impossible because I found all this stuff by accident. It's just like, I kept talking and people were like, okay, maybe you should do this. Maybe you should do that. Like I didn't discover being a teacher. I was told that I should be a teacher and even with yoga teacher tra training, like I, I wasn't going to do that. Um, of course, the first week of doing yoga, I was like, I should be the teacher because like I have an ego that works that way. But, um, you know, someone came up to me and they're like, Hey man, you should go through the yoga teacher training program. I think that would be a good fit for you. And then I just listened and then I did it and then I became a yoga teacher. And then as it turns out, it was a good fit for me. And I had a teacher in high school. He was my tech ed teacher. And we like, you know, I learned how to weld in that class. Don't ask me to weld anything. I don't think I could do it. I could probably figure it out, but it would be ugly. Um, and I learned how to use AutoCAD and all these things that like I have friends that are professionals that make way more money than I do. Um, I learned those skills at, the, at an early age and maybe he saw that like this isn't the gig for you, but he said because I was teaching someone how to weld in class, he's like, Aaron, you know, you'd be a good teacher. And at the time, you know, I had a, like a 2.3 GPA. I had been suspended. Um, you know, my home life was a little wild. It's like, dude, I'm not the teacher. But he said that. And like, then I go to college and I become an English major. And people ha said to me like, oh, are you going to be a teacher? And I was like, of course, I'm not going to be a teacher. It's the dumbest thing. I'm going to be a writer like F. Scott Fitzgerald, which I actually thought. And, um, sometimes I think I might be still cause I'm only 32 coming into my prime, dude. I was watching Jack Ryan the other day. If you haven't seen Jack Ryan on Amazon, um, Jim Halpert crushes it and it's super melodramatic and like terrorist spy way, uh, like CIA, like state department, like all this like super stuff. And then I was looking at, I was like, Jack Ryan, like Jim Halpert got jacked, bro. Like he, he's like six foot two, two ten, Like he's just huge. Um, and I was like, I, th I think to myself, Oh, he's gotta be, he's like my age, right? He's like my age. He's like in his thirties and he just spent a lot of time getting fit. He's 42, man. He's 10 years older than me. So I'm not even in my prime yet, baby. So I got a lot of, I'm going to grow maybe two or three more inches and then, uh, put on about 30 pounds of muscle. That reminds me, I was, I, I did put on some muscle recently and I was talking to a yoga teacher friend of mine and you know, after our yoga class, sometimes after a yoga class, sometimes people like hang out and just kind of chat, which is nice. Um, especially now, cause like we don't get a lot of opportunities for that. So it's like, you know, people are basically where they were on their mats practicing, but we're just talking instead of doing yoga. And we were talking about diet and exercise and fitness. And I had brought up that I was trying to gain some weight. I was trying to put on some muscle. And then I felt the t like the conversation turned to, well, why do you want to do that? And I felt like I had to justify it. I felt like I had to explain why. And maybe it's because like, you know, the people that I was talking to weren't 32 year old skinny white males, right? Maybe that's what it was. Maybe they just didn't see, they, they didn't have my experience growing up being a skinny kid. Um, and so, and again, like whatever, like body image is complicated, always has been, always will be. 
but I wanted to put on muscle, right? And so I want, and I did, and I, I, I'm bigger and stronger now, which is awesome. It feels really good to be stronger. But I felt in that position that it was not, it, it, it would not have been accepted for me to admit, like, I want to look good in a pair of tiny swim trunks. How about that? Don't you? And so I think that there's this thing about the expectation of what a yoga teacher needs to be. It's like, when you know, people think, well, this person should not care about the, the, the vanity should be far from what this person is contending with. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I, f- I feel, I feel like I want to look good. And I felt as if in that space, I couldn't, um, honestly say, no, I'm eating like 3,500 calories. I've cut back on my cardio and I'm focusing just on high rep activities for hypertrophy. Um, and then I'm going to cut my calories down and I'm going to try to slim off the body fat that I accumulated through that six weeks of eating like 3,500 calories. I don't know if you've tried to eat 3,500 calories a day. It is not easy. I mean, you can, if you're eating like junk, but just like, like on a, on a plant-based diet, it is darn near impossible to consistently get 3,500 calories. And when you do, you're like, Oh, it is heavy, man. So I don't know. But I feel most alive teaching yoga. Thought I'd share you that with that with you. But yeah, I, you know, body image is complicated. It's not easy to. It's not easy to be in. Oh, dude, I just listened to a podcast the other day. I listened to. Uh, I can't think of his name. Ethan Shipley. That's who it is. YouTube or Google a picture of Ethan Shipley before and after. He was on Tom Segura's podcast called Tom Talks. Tom Segura is a comedian. Um, and he was on that and he was, they were talking about his weight loss. And so this guy got up, he was an actor. He was in American history X and remember the Titans and my name is Earl. And I'm sure many others. The one I know him from is remember the Titans. He's the lineman, big, heavy, uh, white guy lineman. And, um, he got up to 550 pounds and then now he weighs just a little bit more than I do. He's probably like hovering around 200, maybe a little more, a little less, and he's jacked. And so listening to that podcast, it was it was really nice cuz um it was nice to listen to people speak openly about their desire to want to lose body fat in a way that doesn't and he was so non-judgmental and like, "Hey man, like if this isn't, you know, if this isn't your bag, like if you're not thinking about losing weight, if that if you feel comfortable and happy where you are, keep on grooving." do your thing. But for me, this was the right choice. And it was so inspiring to listen to someone who lost, I mean, he lost like not, he didn't lose a human. He lost like two humans. You know what I mean? He went from 550 to about 200 pounds. I mean, that's almost the weight of two people. Um, it's just insane. Uh, he, and he did it through meal prep, good choices. He said it took him five or 10 years, which is probably the right amount of time. Uh, Cause it takes a while to put that weight on, but body image is, is challenging, man. I want to look good. Don't you, I mean, I want to come out of this COVID space. I remember early days in COVID I was hanging out with some good friends who live in Savannah. And this was before like we realized that COVID was like, but it's before the schools locked down, but it was, I don't know. Maybe the schools were locked down. I don't remember. I don't remember the timeline here, but I was talking to a friend and I said, yeah, man, like I think I've put on like 20 pounds and I had, and it was from, you know, IPAs and pizza and fries. And I was, this is when COVID started in my head. It's like, okay, free game, baby. Let's, let's eat. Let's put it on. And I put on like 15 or 20 pounds. And so I see this friend of mine and he looks good and he looks fit. And I said, yeah, I, you know, kind of put on some weight during COVID. I haven't been exercising as much, been eating a bit too much. And he's like, well, my fitness has sort of stepped up. And he didn't say it like that. Like that wasn't his tone, but that's what I heard, you know. And uh, from then on, it was like I was swinging kettlebells every day. I got back into running. Um, I lost that extra 10 or 15, 20 pounds, whatever it was. And then I was like, I want to put on some muscle. I want to do it. Cause I've never done it. I've never intentionally tried to put on muscle. It's just sort of like, here's my fitness regimen and 
let's do it. Let's just run a lot or do a lot of yoga. And I've never worked with the intention of, I would like to be stronger and bigger, not since high school. That was a big thing in high school. It's like eat. I, I used to take weight gainer in high school, which is a crazy idea. And it was sold at GNC. It's not like I was taking illegal drugs or anything, but it's just, it's far out that, that that's, you have a kid that comes into a, a, a fitness store. And if you're listening to the podcast, I did very strong quotation mark bunny ears. Yeah, it's like you can just go into a store and buy that. That seem ethical? I don't know. I'm going to sip my sip of my soda. <sighs> Posted a picture on my Instagram today uh at Aaron Wayne Yoga and it was of my van. I might have told this story already, so I'll do it briefly. Um Katie and I go, went on a hike uh, about a month and a half ago, month ago, and we go do the hike. It had snowed for a couple days, but like most of the roads were cleared, and we go on this for, um, like fire road, this forest service road, and uh, we go have our hike. We have fun. It was great, great little time, chill, hang out, do our thing, and then we come back. And as we're going to leave, there's a hill, and the van is huge. And I just drive the van because I like driving the van. You know I mean, she has a car, but. I drive the van. I like the van. And so we get up to the top, like three quarters of the way up the hill and it stalls, not the engine, but like the momentum stalls and we start sliding back. And I'm like, Oh my God. Cause at that point you have no control and the van is huge, bro. It's like, it's just massive. And so we stop luckily, like the tires get enough traction on whatever it is they got traction on. And so I'm like, I got to figure this out. So I get out of the van. I jump into the woods like right off the side of the road and I start pulling sticks out of the woods and I start trying to chuck underneath the tires, the sticks to keep it like to give it something to grip more than just the tires. And then after I chuck the wheels with just like random sticks and logs, I go and stand behind the van and I'm like looking around like, okay, what can I do? What are my options? Trying to like game plan and brainstorm solutions. And as I'm doing that, the van starts sliding and then it hits me and almost knocks me over. And I grab onto the bicycle rack behind the van to like hold myself up. And then I'm like, I start pushing on the bicycle rack as if my tush is going to be able to stop a multi-ton vehicle sliding down a hill on ice. So stupid. So then I realized I got to get from behind the van. And so I go around the side and the van starts turning like kind of clockwise and then it's sliding diagonally down the hill. I'm like, Oh my God, my wife is in the van. My dogs are in the van. And this van was extremely expensive, not extremely expensive, but it is expensive for me. And so I run up as it's sli- like we, the van and I meet one another at the driver's side door. I open the door, I fling it open. Katie's holding onto the wheel. Like, what do I do? Cause she is in the passenger seat. She like jumped over into the driver's seat and started turning the wheel. Luckily that's probably the thing that saved my life to keep the van from continuing to go straight until I eventually fell over and went underneath the van. And, um, so she's in the driver's seat. Ganesh, like our Chihuahua had like jumped in her lap because she couldn't like, there's too many things to consider. So like Ganesh is in her lap and she's like holding the wheel and I'm like jumping up. Like I'm a, you know, like I'm trying to, I'm Bob Dylan trying to jump on a train. And, uh, then luckily the van just stops. It hits like some brush that gives it enough traction to stop. And, uh, the punchline of the story is that a, a farmer helps me out. And, uh, Yeah, that story would have been better if I had told it better, but I didn't. And so there you go. I've been doing a lot more like creating lately. I got off the social media for a while and then I got back in the game and um, I feel the sludginess of what social media is capable of doing to your brain. Like I feel that. But I think that having spent so much time away from social media, which was maybe like a month, two months, something like that, where the only time I would check it is from my phone or excuse me, from my computer or maybe download the app on my phone and just see if I had any messages because I don't typically get random messages. I get messages from friends or family and then delete it again. So that helped to establish like I have to intentionally 
get on this app by downloading it. So it's just like one more step to uh, do the thing that I, I, I think I want to do instead of making it so easy where you just open your phone. It's the first thing you see. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go on, get on Instagram. But now I'm using it more and I feel the stickiness of it. I feel like how it's designed to keep me using it. And I've been pretty good about kind of setting it down and leaving the phone in the other room. But I'm definitely creating more, which I like. I think that they should be tools of creation, not tools of consumption. I mean, somebody's got to consume it, right? Somebody's listening to this. You're listening to this podcast. So, um, but I think podcasts are distinct. And this is why I enjoy doing a podcast. And I learned this from Joe Rogan. Shouts out to Rogan. Whatever your thoughts and feelings are about Rogan, those are your thoughts. But I've listened to a lot. I've started listening to Joe Rogan in like, I don't know, 2000. 12 something like that junior year of college 2000 so that would have been like 2010 2011 and i've learned a lot i learned about tim ferris i learned about sam harris i learned about um yeah a lot of people whatever but he, he i've heard him say before like you can't hide in a podcast you can't pretend that you're something that you're not in a podcast because by if people are listening to i mean my podcasts are somewhere between 30 minutes and 60 minutes but his are like three hours. If, if someone's sitting down and listening for that long, they have a pretty good idea of who you are. They can co- sort of suss it out because that's what we do is we're human relationship animals. And so, but, and when you have something like Instagram where it's just like a bite, you're eating junk food, you're taking junk food people, not that the people are junk food, but what they're producing is junk food. It's, it's, it's quick, it's palatable, it's not very nutritionally dense, and you can just have a snack, and then you're like, I'll have another, I'll have another. It's like that Lay's uh, commercial, like, I bet you can't eat just one. Of course you can't just eat one chip. What are we talking about? You can't eat one chip. But, and I was looking at the analytics for my podcast, and the average view time for my podcast is like 14 minutes or something like that. At least it was on YouTube, um, and nobody's watching it on YouTube. But I'm gonna keep making them. I'll keep making them. Keep posting them on YouTube. Um, many more people are listening on Spotify, which I thought was interesting because, like, I don't associate Spotify with podcasts. It's like it's Apple Podcasts or Bust is what I always thought. But far fewer people are listening on Apple. Most people are listening on Spotify. And um, what was I talking about? Oh, podcast. You can't hide in a podcast. You can't. You just can't. You're there and you're talking and people can tell are you full of crap because you might be and people can tell um and there's a lot of people out there that are just so full of crap you know ramdas says ramdas has this great i encourage you to youtube ramdas promises and pitfalls of the spiritual path and the reason i encourage you to listen to that is because he talks about in that how we all are conditioned throughout our lives to wear a mask all the way from like inception or uh, of like not inception but of like when we're turned on and we can start to understand that the things that i do solicit responses from other people and so we're conditioned and that's okay like that's natural and normal like you you have to condition people how to live in society the issue comes in when we identify with the conditioning instead of what is true to us and that's sort of abstract and maybe i can nail it down a little bit you know, if, if I think that um, my title as a teacher is who I am, then I won't be able to truly fulfill the role of being a teacher because I will be caught up in what the abstraction of it is and what the expectations of what a teacher is that are societally expressed. And we contort ourselves to fit into the expectations of what a teacher is, a real estate agent is, what a doctor is, and so on and so forth. And so the titles that we wear are sort of like masks. And to get it even more granular and letting go of like occupational titles, in our relationships, people expect us to be a certain way. For example, the people I was talking about when I said, no, I wanna put on like 10 pounds of muscle. Like there's an expectation in our relationships of I will be who you want me to be. 
if you just pretend that I'm actually them. And so the masks that we wear are a form of subtle coercion of the other, but the real insidious thing is the coercion of ourselves to get ourselves to fit into the thing that other people are expecting of us. So it's like, I'll pretend that you are who you say you are. So long as you pretend that I'm actually who I say I am. And the issue is that you aren't actually presenting yourself as you are. You're presenting yourself in a way that is aggregating all of these teeny tiny unconscious and conscious data points that society has given us in order to manifest what a cool hip millennial looks like or behaves like or i mean i mean there's a million examples and so it's not until we can begin to shed those things the bags that we're carrying that society gave to us that like we didn't consent to we just unconsciously assimilated into our lives the role of like no this is how a teacher behaves this is how someone like doing a podcast like this is weird you don't know anybody that does a podcast who do you know that does a podcast nobody you're not supposed to that's for famous people that's for people who've written books that's for people who've you know, that's for movie stars and comedians it's like nobody does a podcast that's not normal that's not about that's not the expectation you're not supposed to do this but it's an exercise finding little things like this like this podcast project that i'm on is an expression of me saying no you can't tell me what to do because i'm trying to figure out who i am and i'm trying to become who i can be like i paint my nails sometimes I have, it's all off now. My toenails are black. Those are painted. Sometimes I paint my fingernails and I intentionally paint my fingernails as a cisgendered hetero man that has a full beard and, you know, sometimes I chop wood, you know, sometimes I do manly things. I used to eat a lot of meat. Don't anymore. Um, I don't know. What else is manly? I'll spit on the floor and I'll pee outside. Those are, those are things men do, but I also paint my nails because I won't let you tell me who I'm supposed to be. So find something like that. What is the thing that people don't want you to do? Go do that because they're probably telling you not to do it because they're too afraid to face themselves. They're too afraid to think, well, if he paints his nails, he must be, is he, is he trans? Is he into dudes is he first of all like whatever maybe i am i'm not but whatever maybe i am but i'm not um why is he doing a podcast i'm like turning this into a therapy session i don't mean to yell at you i'm sorry that i was yelling at you what i'm trying to say is there are things that people don't want you to do and the reason they don't want you to do them is because then they have to face the fact that they're not doing things because they think other people don't want them to do them and it's this real like mind game of i don't think you want me to do this so i won't do it but you're presupposing that you have any idea what other people are thinking you have no idea what other people are thinking you can guess but like the guessing is creating a stiltification of who you could be. I burped while I was saying that. It, I shouldn't drink fizzy water while I do the podcast. One of the things that reading, writing, meditation, a regular yoga practice, the greatest gift that all of these tools can give you is the realization that you are powerful enough to be who you are now are you going to be or am i going to be what all those instagram weaponized positivity people tell us go live your dream make six figures a month find your passion and pursue it all this cheesy bs that you see out there is that all true it's like sort of true but it's not really true am i going to be the next elon musk yeah i am that's what this whole podcast is leading up to. We just spent 45 minutes together and I'm here to tell you that I'm going to be the richest man in the world.
No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's a lot of bogus fake inspiration out there that is trying to get you to emulate them. Their cars, their status, their prestige. They are modeling what they want you to think you can be. When in reality, what we ought to be doing is shedding all of the bogus stuff that society has given us so that we can actually be ourselves. So finding ways and practices, reading, writing, meditation, yoga, fitness, relationship uh, conversation, nonviolent communication, all of these things, all of these tools bring us closer to realizing who we actually are. Because society is trying to put us in a state where we don't pay attention to who we are. Because if we were all to become who we are, what would they sell us? They'd have nothing. And it's not a conspiracy. I'm not saying that like, I'm not saying the Illuminati is getting together and saying, we need to get these people to think they're worthless because we need to sell BMWs. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is a happy byproduct for them. By creating a situation where people aren't actualized and confident and understand that they have, do they have power to rule the world? No, that's not what I'm saying. That's for a select few of people who have the will, capability, intellect, and desire to run the masses of people. Are you going to be a CEO? No, that's for people who have that skill set, either innately or through the work to have that skill set. But you do have the power to be powerful in whatever that shows up as. But you have to practice it. You have to practice. And that practice could be doing something that's not normal and embracing what it means to not be normal. Because normal is kind of screwed up. Normal is your primary mode of communication is through text. Normal is spending time on your phone while you're watching TV and eating dinner, which I do. I'm not judging because I'm normal. Normal is not paying attention to income inequality. Normal is trying to pretend that you're happier than you actually are. That's what's normal. So we have to break normal. We have to do things that aren't normal and be honest. When you have a crappy class as a yoga teacher, you share that or make something. It takes risk to make something. You put yourself out there. I'm like, co- I'm coaching myself. I'm yelling at you guys again. I'm sorry. This is just like Aaron's personal self-help, but it's true. You have to do things. We are here to do things. You know, Marcus Aurelius says in meditations, you know, when you, when the sun comes up, Something, I don't know what, I don't know what he says. He says something to the effect of like, when the sun comes up and you want to continue laying in bed, you have to break that because you are a human and you do the things that humans do. It is the work of a human to get up and do their work. The Bhagavad Gita says you have the right. And again, there's another sloppy paraphrase. That's what I should name this podcast. Sloppy paraphrases. The Bhagavad Gita. If you don't know what the Bhagavad Gita is, it's a Hindu scripture um, written, I think 600 BC, dude, there was so much stuff going on in 600 BC, so much stuff, Buddha, Confucius, Taoism, so much stuff going on in 600 BC. I think they just throw that number on there. Like when did this happen? I don't know when you think it happened. Well, call it 600. So 600 BC Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita says you have the right to the labor but you don't have the rights to the fruits of your labor. So we can take that as meaning. And Bhagavad Gita also says any work done properly is a form of spiritual practice. And so doing something and doing it with the best of intention and with clarity of mind is in of itself a form of spiritual practice. Let go of the, what you think spiritual practice is and just like, just take in what that means in a way that makes sense to you. 
you know, it doesn't have to be, I'm not saying that like, I'm not a transcendental sort of kind of guy. I'm talking about like a spiritual experience is when you're at an EDM concert and the music's like, and everybody's like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's a spiritual experience. Spiritual experience is crying when you see a baby be born. Spiritual experience is standing and looking at the Grand Canyon and realizing that it's the biggest thing that you are capable of seeing. Not the biggest thing that you've ever seen, but you can't see anything bigger because your eyes won't let you. Spiritual experience is falling in love. I almost cried in meditation today. I was thinking about my wife and I was thinking, I should be better. Not because I'm bad. I think I'm a good husband, but I should be better because the love that I have for her demands that she gets the best from me and I don't always give her my best. That's a spiritual experience. These things are spiritual experiences and making something and letting go of what the outcome is. That is a spiritual experience. That is spiritual practice. Yeah. I think we wrap it. Could I get more fired up than that? Okay, notifications. Got these notifications. I gotta go teach yoga. This podcast is an opportunity for me to talk about a lot of the stuff I talk about in yoga, but I only get to talk about it for like seven seconds at a time. Because then it's like, and now engage your glutes. So I can only talk a little bit about this stuff in the yoga practice. And then if I start talking about this stuff with my students, they're like tuned in for just a second. So long as I sound like I'm on TikTok and I'm being inspirational, they're dialed in. But as soon as I get into like the details, they tune out. I can just see it in their faces. That's what this podcast is for, to expand on my teaching. Because I am a teacher. Look at me. Isn't that a smug title? Teacher? It's the smuggest title you could have. What do you do for a living? I teach. So smug. People say educator, but I'm not an educator. I'm a teacher. I don't know what the difference is. I was supposed to end this podcast 60 seconds ago. I'm going to wrap it, guys. I hope you guys are uh, kicking it. Hope you're having fun. Hope you're doing well. Hope you can build something and let go of the expectation of what you think the expectation actually is so that you can actually be yourself. I love you guys. If you haven't heard it today, I love you. All right, guys. Peace out. Went all over the place. If you're interested, follow along at Aaron Wayne Yoga on Instagram. Shoot me an email at hello at Aaron Wayne Yoga. There was another thing that I told myself that I would remember to tag on the end of my podcast, but I don't remember what it was. So everything's on the website. On YouTube too, Aaron Wayne Yoga. I got some practices on there, some power practices, some meditation, and continuing to build because I like to build stuff. All right, man. Peace out.